welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the panel today. Uh, I'm Todd Rose with InMobi. And today we are going to discuss the three A's of advertising. And uh, as I thought about that title, actually, I think we're really talking about the three hottest A's of advertising. I can think of about eight or 10 A's that probably populate the pantheon of A's when we're talking about advertising. But the three hottest A's that you will hear in conversation all around the Quasette. Uh, so obviously AI, addressability, and attention metrics. Um, so to set a little bit of context on that, um, you know, obviously our industry's ability uh, to connect with brands is getting ever challenged with the disruptive impact of AI and the ongoing deprecation of mobile advertising IDs uh, and the imminent demise of cookies. Um, the rapid rise and adoption of AI is obviously creating uh, uncertainties but also opportunities for efficiencies that haven't existed before. Uh, so through it all, can people-first approaches to addressability and attention metrics help to solve and, and be an antidote uh, to this industry conundrum? How will AI complicate uh, this delicate balance between people and machines? We're going to explore those questions and others uh, in, uh, in the context of this panel. So I'm going to now uh, have everyone introduce themselves, but just really quickly I'll give names and then give you each about 30 seconds to talk about who you are. But we have Matthew Roach, uh, CEO of ID5, Jay Patasol from Forrester, we have Amy Owen from UM, Tamar Hassan from Human, and then Ole Kornfeld here from CMI Media Group. So maybe start with Matthew. Should I get a start? Oh, sorry. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Matthew. I'm the CEO of ID5, and uh, ID5 is a ad uh, addressability uh, solution. So we're an identity company. Uh, we support um, buyers and sellers of advertising to uh, recognize people so that we can do measurable and addressable advertising, which is what powers this whole world that we live in. And good morning. Hi, I'm Jay Patasol. I'm a vice president and uh, principal analyst at Forrester. I cover marketing services and creativity and artificial intelligence and creativity. Um, and Forrester, as you know, is a technology consulting company uh, and research company and uh, thrilled to be here with you guys. Hi, Amy Owen uh, from UM. I actually started and now run the uh, commerce practice at Universal McCann. Uh, we focus on everything addressable. Uh, we make sure that we are driving sales, whether it be online or in the physical store. And I want to thank Moby for the fourth A, air condition. Uh, so thank you for having me. <laughs> Second that on air conditioning. I'm Tamara Hassan. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Human Security. We have a set of solutions that protect ad tech and uh, media and other industries from fraud, abuse, compliance use cases. We see about 20 trillion internet interactions every week. We touch about 3 billion uh, unique devices a month, upwards of half the global population we see on a regular basis. And um, we do this across ad tech, media, financial services, e-commerce, traditional fraud use cases there uh, end to end. And uh, I am Oleg Kornfeld. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of CMI Media Group. We are part of the WPP family. We're a health-specific agency. We basically have two, uh, two consumers, uh, the doctors and the patients. And uh, when, it, when it comes to audience targeting, when it, talks, uh, it comes to uh, addressability and ability to target these types of consumers, there's two completely different worlds. So my role is kind of build technology to support specifically healthcare professional targeting, the physicians, because uh, there's not, not, not a lot of technology out there that is specifically focusing on, on this very particular um, nuance. And then obviously partner with a lot of technologies because obviously we're not going to go out there and build everything ourselves. But we partner with other MarTech and EdTech to integrate into our own platforms for planning and buying. Excellent. So let's start with, uh, we'll dive into AI and we'll start with the big open-ended question. Um, how will generative AI and predictive analytics come together to enhance uh, target advertising content in ways that couldn't happen in the past to optimize programmatic advertising. And really looking for your thoughts across the value chain, whether it's creative development, targeting decisions, bidding technologies, optimization. Want to get your thoughts throughout that value chain and I open it to everyone to start first. Um, I can start with some research. Uh Right now, uh, CMOs in the in US, specifically with this database, 
Uh, 44% of, of CMOs indicate that they're using generative AI as part of their media execution. Now, I think it's, it's very interesting. I, I, I believe that to be the case, but I also believe that to potentially be uh, perhaps some AI confusion as to exactly which, tech, which AI technologies are being used. The, the next use case that follows is content development. Um, uh, as well as um, uh, media planning and buying. So, you know, the most pervasive that we see and we hear about all the time is, is content development. 56% um, of, of CMOs have told us that they are currently using generative AI as part of their overall marketing um, uh, execution. That jumped, that's, that comes from Q2, that jumped from 19% in Q1. I mean, so it's, it's like, it's a race, it's growing. Um, and I think the, the use cases are, as, as we see them, are, are broad and across the board. Um, media, SEO, uh, and heavily, heavily content uh, development at this stage. I think that there's very clear application of generative AI in particular around the whole um, art part of the advertising community. There's art and science. And on the science side, the way we look at it is, Recognizing consumers mean processing signals to be able to identify you know, devices and recognize kind of users' behavior. And so AI is like a, a turbocharged uh, a learning, machine learning environment that you can apply to increasingly less and less signals. So there's two challenges we have to address. One is how do we get the signals and then how do we process them? AI is a clear solution for the second part. The access to signal is the, is the other chat, side, of the, side of the challenge, but clearly the, our ability to process signal and to, rec to recognize devices over time uh, uh, with the use of, of applications uh, of artificial intelligence is, is going to grow massively. I, I think one of the drivers of innovation always is iteration, how fast you can test and get feedback. This is true and fundamental to most areas that modernize and evolve. And if the th one thing about AI we all hear is how rapid it will be. And, and there, the logic for that is in that innovation cycle. When you think about the other end of the spectrum, what's really slow, I think about architecture. My, my parents were architects. Putting up a skyscraper from the point you design it to the point it's up could take 10 years. And then you get feedback on your design, right? And do that over and over, it's very slow. The one time, the one period that it innovated quickly, Harvard did this um, amazing paper on it, I believe it was Harvard, of um, the innovation in Chinese architecture. And what was happening is that in China, they were putting up skyscrapers in six months, right? And they modernized most of modern architecture in the commercial space because they could do it faster. Now, take AI in this context, this is what starts to you know, become mind-blowing to me, right, is you have this ability now to do creative um, uh, content and programmatic creative, and you also have this uh, thing that can also do rapid optimization. And what happens when you connect that where an AI can actually, not A, B test, but A to Z test across the entire ecosystem simultaneously at the same time modifying creative, right, for, you know, m micro iteration in, in a way that would take months or weeks before. I think that's the rapid scale up that will happen here. Um, in the end, every business will have to decide whether AI is strategic or an enabler, enhancer. In other words, it's something that'll make everybody faster, better in the org, or if it's truly strategic um, because of the area for us in cybersecurity, it's strategic in marketing and ad tech, I think it's st strategic. I'll actually start with a pet peeve. I think AI is the wrong term for all of this. There's n the intelligence not artificial at all. It's sort of human intelligence that drives all of this. Um, yeah, but HI didn't, didn't work with the, no, the three A's, the four A's. So. I know. But Sorry, machine man. learning actually is the right term. If Whenever look, I said that, I got weird Machine looks. learning is the right term for this. And actually, I'm interested. I, I, I'm not sure if they're doing it on purpose. Everything Apple does, I think, is on purpose. They never use AI to describe what they're doing. It's always machine learning. It's very interesting how they're positioning yeah. uh, what, what they're doing there. But uh, the key here, again, that human intelligence element, the data set that, that you're building uh, these algorithms on, and the decision trees, these if-then statements in this narrow AI world that we live in, because there's two types of AI we're talking about, right? There's general AI, which is separate from generative, and then there's narrow AI. And I think everything we're talking about is narrow AI, is those if-then statements um, that, that you, you need human intelligence to design correctly for the outputs to be useful. So for, for us, 
there, there is, we're a media agency in the end of the day, technology data driven media agency. So our job is to invest our clients' dollars as efficiently and effectively as possible. So how can we take the, those data sets and what can we do in the process? So your question about applications of it, in this, some of it may not be as sexy, activation of campaigns in ad servers, building bots around uh, all of that activation and the removing uh, the armies of traffickers basically um, is an amazing low hanging fruit that we already implemented in our company. And then the second element of it is the, that analytics uh, optimization, the data set, the measurement that we get from campaign, campaign performance and applying it to any kind of an omni-channel strategy because the way we activate, again, like I said, we're, we're targeting physicians and patients in the physician case, like where do we find these doctors, right? so, through which channels, and how do we get the data sets to decide and recommend quickly which channel is the best to take, because it's not that many impressions we can buy to begin with to, to target these doctors, and then, find, and then how do we personalize the message in the end of the day. So if we spend all this effort deciding the path, or the omni-channel path, then the creative, the personalization creative has to match. That loop is absolutely driven by machine learning. And I'll just add too, from a commerce perspective, we're actually in the practice of understanding media consumption and consumer behaviors. So AI for us is a, not necessarily a new term, uh, but it's also understanding how we're adapting to it as, as people. So you say that it's you know, human intelligence, and in my mind it's, are we going to grab onto it? Um, is it gonna make our lives easier? And so that's what we're actually doing from our standpoint, understanding how many people are actually utilizing it, and then how do we go about targeting those people and utilizing it for optimization and things like that. So it's a little bit different from our perspective, but um, I'll accept it as long as you guys do too. <laughs> I, I love the distinction, Ole, that you um, started to draw between really machine learning and AI, really. Um, I think of machine learning more as optimization around a constrained set of parameters or a defined set of parameters, AI a little bit more free flowing to make decisions outside of that set of parameters at a, at a very high level. Um, when we talk about like true AI, um, I kind of want to ask the question, uh, how do you, I, I don't know if you guys saw this going around uh, on the internet, but there was this um, fictional beer commercial that was created using AI, and it ended up having uh, folks in the, in the commercial were, had 12, 14 fingers, they were suckling from floating beer cans of weird shapes, there were bonfires everywhere, basically went off the rails. So the question is, how do you keep the AI from going on an acid trip? Uh, in, I'm curious if more people, more people buy the, buy the beer. <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the video technology and the, and the imaging technology is not where you necessarily want it to be at this stage. And uh, uh, that's a matter of time. Um, so uh, yeah, you're going you're gonna to find distorted images um, like this. The, what the platforms are doing is uh, they're trying to rein that in and they're trying to constrain things like uh, the, these uh, the, you know, hallucinations either in response or these amalgamations of these, you know, visually distracting or, mm -hmm. or grotesque uh, uh, looking issues. And so it's a balance of like, it's a balance of uh, the, the, you know, the, the, a robust set of, of training data that, that can produce the result that's being asked for um, versus the constraints that they're trying to, to put in place to, to you know, to prevent hallucination or prevent these grotesque looking images from being produced in the results. And I, I, the, over time, that'll get worked out, but it's going to take probably, I would think, 12 months or so. Yeah, the, the grotesque is the least of our problem. The diversity bias that come out of this, those kind yeah. of skewed testing uh, or training uh, uh, sets that the AI have been learning from mm -hmm. is a huge issue as well. And I, I think, it, you know, there's a lot of calls for regulation. I don't know if it's regulation or if it's like, you know, some form of like framework for this thing to operate, but yeah, it's, it's, again, it's only as good as the, as the data you feed it in, mm -hmm. so. Right. It's almost like we need human intelligence to, mm -hmm. <laughs> you definitely, to no. keep an eye on all of it. You definitely need the human touch, and I'll give you a personal example. So someone sent me a link to do a AI headshot, and I was like, oh, this is great. I hate my headshot, so like, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll invest in it. Got them back. I had three arms. Sometimes I didn't have an arm. I, my eyes, I have blue eyes, but my eyes were, it looked like the devil somehow in my eyes. And I emailed back 
and a human actually retouched them up. Right. So I think there's that human touch to kind of rein it in a little bit. But you can do, do that, that with creative devel development when there's a human curation and editing process mm -hmm. before it goes live. Mm -hmm. When you make these real-time optimization decisions, if not real-time content generation, you don't have that that you mm -hmm. know. But all of the, all, all, all of that is done after all the training. Right should be completed, right? But by the time it's in production, right? So the, the, the training of the bot that is making those decisions, hopefully, already can avoid it adding a third arm. And, and, and post-human <laughs> review. Yeah. Like, the, what, what you're describing is the human review has to happen prior. with the assets right. prior to their, to their release. Or else I mean, you're going to have a very um, yeah. disgruntled customer. Right. Look, look, I <laughs> but, but I think the implication is, is, is pretty huge in that, you know, Dynamic creative optimization was a great idea. It was hard to execute. This worked out, potentially makes that possible, you know, in that you've got the you've you, you've got the signals, you can you can target the audiences. It was it was a compiling the the, the assets that was always the, the problem, and this is a big solve for that, I think. Yeah, I, I think that we're just seeing relics of a brand new space and that these will all get worked out. In the end, the promise of one of the promises of machines in general is that they don't make as many mistakes as human. I spent you know, over 10 years in the Air Force in flying aircraft, and the cause of 98 plus percent of accidents was human error, right? And any complex tax will have that. I think in the long run, um, the mistakes will be fewer than, than what we would That's make. Such a great point. It's the speed and accuracy. Like the, when I talk to my clients about the opportunities, and when I talk to them, hey, we're going to automate this process for you. So the first question, okay, so we're cutting costs because you don't have all these people now. Like, no, we're not cutting costs. We're now shifting the investments into building the bots and maintaining the bots, different set of expertise that now needs to get hired to manage all of it. But first and foremost, the reason why we're doing it is for the accuracy and for the speed. Yeah, so the, this point about Humans are usually the cause of mistakes. Your point, um, uh, as well about the biases, and it kind of leads into our next set of questions I want to explore, which is really AI will create these opportunities, whether unintended or not, for abuse and for reinforcement of, of inherent biases. Um, so I want to explore how do we make sure the AI doesn't go all NSA on us, become too invasive. Um, and actually, I'm going to have some specific questions here. And we actually used AI uh, to prompt some questions to interrogate itself on how to keep it uh, you know, from going off the rails. Uh, so the first one, um, what steps can marketers take to ensure transparency in AI algorithms and build trust with consumers in an era where automated systems are making these decisions? So I, I can start again. We just spent 10 years, if not more, validating every data point, every data set, every segment. Where is it coming from? How is this data aggregated? How often is it refreshed? So we're, we, we, I think we got to a good point of kind of real understanding the fund, fundamental data that we're using for just targeting media. So we should not ignore it and just trust some chatbot to come up with an answer without understanding the initial data set it was built on. So the answer, the long-winded way to, to, to answer that question is, really understanding the fundamental data set that these recommendations are built on. Yeah, I, um, interesting. My, my head goes back to just sources of bias in general, and we have to recognize that humans are inherently architecturally biased, right? And there's a lot of studies on this and in uh, what happens when you have uh, different paradigms in your head to your decision making. I even think of uh, one of the studies, I'm sure a lot of people have read it at some point, of judges, uh, how in the afternoon they make more severe uh, decisions because they're grumpier, right? And these are professional decision makers with people's lives at stake and it's inherent in their bias, right? So I, I actually think there is more promise in the long run for um, for that bias in AI. And I think the true answer to the question is more of a technical answer. Uh, neural networks are inherently non-transparent. It's nearly impossible to trace it. There's a, there's a bunch of technical approaches in machine learning to try and guess what the neural network, why it said it did, but um, that's, uh, it's still a difficult technical problem. Yeah, and I, I go back to, um, you know, Meta dele delayed its release of its AI 
um, for a long time. I think you guys probably all read the stories because every time they would train it, it ended up being unbelievably racist and sexist at the end of the day. So they couldn't release it to the public. Well, is the, is the data set this. they train it on the Facebook the, the post Facebook platform? Data set. <laughs> yeah. What a surprise! <laughs> no, exactly right. But when you when you set these systems out in the wild, how do you make sure for ad targeting decisions that you're not letting these data sets that could be pollutive um, get into that training set? Tagging content. I mean, ChatGPT right now has a lot of people human manually tagging content to look like when the results come back, they come back automated. They pay people by hour to do this. Yeah, I think, and they're still failing, right? I don't think it's a training problem. Um, just like you know, it's uh, it's not with humans. The answer for humans being biased isn't. Um, you know, uh, well, it's training an unconscious bias, right? What, yeah, education so, plays a big part of that, so right? So to me, it's like, what is the unconscious bias training for an AI where they can recognize bias and correct it rather than inherently be unbiased? Because yeah. bias comes from training on data. There's no way around that. Yeah. Well, part of the solution is bespoke models. You know, it's not a, like a, a universal or generalized model where you've got, you know, you're you're using someone's model, whether it's Microsoft or OpenAI or or Facebook, but you're building on top of that, right? There's there's you know there's your company's data that sits on top of that. There's the client's data that potentially sits on that. There's brand standards that has to sit on top of that. And you get to the point where and you 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 include audience in that, and it gets very very specific. You know, now it's not going to necessarily solve, you know, for for the biases, but like the more the more data that, that's there, the 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 more likely you are to be able to kind of remove some of the issues that might be in conflict with the brand or in conflict with the audience. Um, and so, uh, do we need large language models? Yes, as the base. But what we need to build uh, uh, up and vertically is brand language models. You know, that are bespoke to client execution and. And, and I think that starts you along, it doesn't solve everything, but it gets you along the path, you know. That makes a lot of sense. Um, another question the AI prompted to interrogate itself. Uh, with AI-driven advertising, how can marketers empower consumers to have more control over the ads that they're seeing uh, and allow for personalized experiences that they actually have input into? Or is that not even relevant? I don't know if it's AI related, but I'd love to see a world where we have more of a feedback loop from consumers. Say, I like that, I don't like that, I agree with this, I don't agree with this, right? I think, I mean, I might, I might take everything back to identity for a reason, but when, when we talk about consent for you know, being identified, like accepting cookies on websites and everything, the, 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 the value exchange is very rarely explained. And so there's no real feedback loop, right? People say yes or no, but we don't, you don't know why they say yes or no. So I'd like to see a world where we have more feedback loop or we have more like engagement from consumers because in the end, that's what makes the audience valuable to brands. That's what makes the audience interact with content better. Like, so maybe that's, that's something we can push because it, it becomes even more important with AI, with, with kind of you know, automated, generated content and creatives. Um, so maybe that's a way forward for us to think about. I'm just wondering, again, um what, what is the experience for the consumer to provide this kind of feedback? Because whenever a consumer is asked point blank, are you comfortable with data being collected on you and personalization of the ads and everything else, the answer is no. But all of their behavior says they don't care. I don't know if it says they don't care. I think it says that if you, if you explain it better than just, right. so that's just, just by asking them ask app not to track or allow, uh, if you explain them that the, the advertiser is paying for the weather forecast that they yes. go on the site to check and everything, and that you know they could pay themselves if they'd rather want to, but like the trade-off is, you know, if we have access to your email address or whatever, we can. I think you know, it, it's I mean, a question the, of explaining the experience of yeah. uh, how do you want to communicate with the consumer, where you're not driving them immediately into that kind of ne negative space of. Yeah, I feel like you have to entice them for something. to almost do it. You have to entice them to do yeah. it. So subconsciously, like you check yes, you just want to move forward through like that whatever that screen is. But ultimately, if you're asking them outright, you have to give them some sort of reward, in a way. And that's consumer behavior today. But it does might not be consumer behavior. You know, six months from now, it could change drastically. It is one of the promises of AI in this in this paradigm that it's acting on behalf of right. us, right? We each have our own agent 
right, that might have access to sensitive data. And I think that's where it gets really interesting because it starts to address a lot of privacy questions. My own personal AI that knows, you know, medical things, personal things, where I'm living and that I need a product in this area and this how can go act on my behalf. Right? And I think that's where it gets really interesting is that it can do a lot more with data safely as a broker. Who right? do we the, trust the, to, to take that data, ingest yeah. it, and use it to personalize AI? That's Facebook. a big question. Well, H who? Yes. who? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question because um, uh, Jay and I were just talking about yeah. this. Microsoft's um, AI chat um, is rolling out a chat ads function. So there's two parts of the API. There's the chat API for the human prompt, and then there's an ads API that links into everything that they're doing. And I don't think we know exactly how that will look, but they are you know, building that into the advertising but, portion. But the of it. potential is there that if you've got if you've got a brand language model, you have a, a personal language model and you give your your own personal language model or personal API the levels of permission um, that, that you're comfortable with, you know, and, uh, and and provide it the information that you're comfortable with it uh, addressing and understanding. And so it's I mean we're really talking about mass personalization at scale that we've been talking about for what, like 10 years, but like actually being able to maybe achieve this a little bit more so. I don't know that it gets you all the way there, but it, it yeah. moves things along in that direction. So next question, where do we draw the line between what AI can do um, and continue beyond the limits of human imagination versus what do we need to rely on humans to ultimately do? We talked about human curation but where else do we see sort of the limits and where humans need to still drive the, drive the ship, if you will? Well, I think it's a tool, right? So we want, we want it to do things that are useful for us. Let's not try to invent a solution to a problem that doesn't exist, right? right? Let's use it as a tool. It's a tool to optimize processes. It's a tool to kind of, you know, make less mistakes. Um, I think that should be the driving mentality behind how we approach it. Yeah, I think, I think there's always a disruption cycle with new t forms of technology, right? And for this, I think m my personal forecast is that within 10 years, entire industries will be disrupted. And the real question is which ones? And I, I think it's not the ones we're always thinking about, but it's the ones that are high skilled, right? The high skilled complex ones where humans uh, can make more mistakes where transparency is lower where they're difficult problems and that starts um, Certainly in the, in the marketing side, but legal is a big one writing code is another one and You know, I, I would say within three to five years this the, the startup tech cycle there will be solutions AI based solutions for most uh, high skill roles and then the question is, how long does it take to disrupt the industry? That should take 10 to 15 to 20 years usually. I think it'll be rapid, three to five years, because the AI-powered solutions will be so much better than the non-AI-powered solutions. It's probably another three to five years. So my guess is that within 10 years, the high-skilled areas like legal, writing code, maybe parts of marketing, um, I think, again, I think about aviation because my first day of pilot training in the Air Force was them handing me a book of every mishap in the aircraft that I was about to fly hundreds of pages, and it was all human. So, you know, if an AI can do it better without making the mistakes, same thing with driving cars. Um, uh, I think that's right. Uh, we, we've done, we have a forecast that looks specifically at the U.S. advertising industry, and there are two important pieces of data in this that, that not only answer the question, but but basically corroborate what you're saying. And the first piece, you know, as to the, the human contribution is the forecast shows that of all the job characteristics that exist, and there are, you know, dozens of them, the one that is most difficult to automate, anybody want to guess? It's creativity. It's actually defined as originality. So original thought is the hardest thing to, to replicate, whereas physical motions, um, specific skill sets, uh, knowledge, all of those things are, e are easier to, to, to automate. So the, the, the human will always have to contribute original thought mm -hmm. in whether it's marketing or technology or business or legal or whatever the, whatever the industry. To your point about um, three to five years and high skills, 100% because the other piece of data inside this forecast is that looking specifically at generative AI, the generative AI influence increases 
as the salary range increases. Now it drops at the very top. Guess guess why, right? Um, guess what? But the higher the higher paid, higher education roles are more either in threat or assisted by generative AI. And so again, I think the the, the creative problem solving skill set is the one that that will continue to be the thing that 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 we br no matter the industry that we bring um, in relation with our tools, you know, that help us execute and help mm -hmm. achieve speed, help predict, you know, be predictive or, or deterministic as necessary. So, yeah, I think that's the answer. It's slightly tangential, but it, it makes me think about education. As if you look at, so I've got my daughters are going to university in a couple of years, and so we're starting to look at universities and what degree they're going to take. And, and universities basically like ingest as much data as you can and then use that data to come up with, with you know, solutions to problems. Well, that's what AI does. And it'll do it much better than any super smart human brain. So how do we think about education in, a, in, a, in an AI world? We need to shift, right? We need to shift around like how do you, how do you become creative? How do you do things that machine can't do better than you, right? That's, what, that's going to be the, the, the focus for education for the next kind of 20 years so that our kids have, have a, a good place in this world. That's, uh, I think that, and it's not related to advertising at all, getting a bit philosophical here, but like I think that's, a, that's a, 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 the parallel is, is striking between how we educate kids right now and what AI actually does. In other words, you should be able to bring your graphing calculator to the test in school. <laughs> I, did, I did want to bring it back to advertising. I, I want to direct this one to you, Tomer. Um, so you, you started us off down the road of how different functions and jobs will change. How do you see it impacting AI being used, or how are you envisioning using it to measure brand safety in the context of your company going forward? Yeah, it's a great question. I think more broadly from the cybersecurity and risk perspective, we see, at Human, we see our goal as protecting the $600 billion that's spent in digital today and all the risks to that. Now, AI is really interesting. Um, the first principle always to remember is that technology is democratic. Everybody can use it, attackers using it, right? I remember somebody once telling me that the industry that innovates the fastest is the porn industry. I, I, I think it's the cybersecurity industry. It, attackers adopt techniques faster than anyone else. We've seen machine learning uh, used in, uh, in fraud uh, over the years, when you have a million infections, you can train on people's actual data. Um, so, so that's the first place I go, is just how will it be used? Um, but there's other areas that are non-obvious. Uh, new attack services, right? Digital transformation brought all kinds of things online that weren't online anymore, exposed a whole bunch of attack services. Now, what happens when we start placing AI at the heart of what we do? What happens when AI is um, taken over, influenced AI poisoning, for example, feeding bad data to the AI so it gives bad results. AI takeover, our number one use case in uh, fraud outside of the media is account takeover, somebody breaching your username passwords. What happens if that is an AI? There's an airline right now that will, uh, a top tier airline, that will replace all frontline customer support with AI-based chatbots. What's the implication of that being taken over where they're interacting with your first line customer? Um, so, so we think about that a lot too um, uh, from a risk perspective. Excellent. Um, I promise three A's. We're still on AI. We're going to segue into addressability, but largely in the context of AI. So um, big question here. Will AI, will AI supplant people-based approaches to addressability, or will it build on or enhance uh, those you know, sort of data-driven people-based approaches that we rely on today? Yeah, I think, again, going with the consumer behaviors, it's going to enhance it. It's not going to replace anything. Uh, from my standpoint, everything that I do is addressable. So in the retail media space, I'm targeting people based on their behaviors, based on their media consumptions. So, I mean, one of the AI... Um, developments that came out was with Instacart, and so it's asking Instacart to give them recipes and then, then show them what foods are in the recipes. So that's something that enhances the consumer experience, and then now I could target you based on what you're asking, uh, the chatbot essentially. So it's going to enhance it more so than replacing anything, at least in, in my world. I agree, but it, I think it goes back to identity, kind of agreeing that we're gonna use the same way to identify a, a consumer. So the AI understands which path to follow. Mm -hmm. You sure? 
<laughs> no, go for it. <laughs> uh, so no, I, I, it, I think from from a, from a, it it augments everything, right? It augments our ability to process data and signals, right? And that's at the heart of uh, how we recognize people and and we process signals to recognize their devices and connect their devices at, at the user level, at the household level. So it's just going to make that process much faster, much more efficient. Uh, again, machine learning, you know, on steroids. Um, the question is, do we have access to the signals to power the recognition engine? And that's, that's, that's the, 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 the challenge we're facing right now with cookies and IDFAs and, and IP addresses and like those signals kind of being restricted. Um, but it's more of a technical you know, access challenge than an, an applica the applications are just getting better and better, right? I, I think we are approaching the end of this version of the internet that we all knew and it's gonna be replaced by something completely different. And um, when you think about the implications of an autonomous agent acting on your behalf as a consumer, and potentially brands having autonomous agents acting on their behalf, you start to see uh, where this could go in the long run is basically AI's agents acting on uh, brokering with each other. It's a broker model, right? So. You know, your, your autonomous agent shows up in its bow tie and says, I have a client. She's working on her morning routine. She needs this kind of skincare product. She has these medical considerations and, you know, is looking for a product in this area. And the brand AIs or whatever it is, you know, publish all the information where th they can bring that in. And what do you have then? What is the internet? The internet is actually was always designed for machines to talk to each other. That that's the the reason for a lot of security problems on the internet is because the protocols were designed for machines, not for humans. And so I think that's an entirely new world. I don't even know how to think of where you um, what happens to the publishing industry. What what, what happens to brand advertising when uh, you know it's really just essentially a broker model where agents are acting on each other's behalf. Right, what happens to websites when they dynamically render the content that people are most interested in, in seeing? It's not a, we're not having a common experience at a website, you're having an individual experience. Provided that, that the data is in place, you know, the identity is in place. But that's to, right, to provided in, yeah. in the human innovation was there, right? So yeah. uh, machines can iterate whatever the initial set of innovations yeah. were, right? So it's always kind of post-creation. It'll always be idea. a companion, yeah, I agree. Uh, but I wonder how long it'll take for brand marketers to do AI-based SEO strategies, right? Where your SEO strategy has to include making sure you're relevant in an AI prompt answer to somebody's question. I mean, ChatGPT was one of the fastest adopted technologies in history in the first month or something, right? The number of people that signed up and started doing all their queries on it. How do you become relevant in that response? It's a really uh, interesting question. Uh, that segues into sort of a related question around this. Um, how will generative AI, uh, or sorry, will generative AI help marketers speed up their addressability roadmaps, or does it throw a wrench into the equation? In other words, should the roadmaps sort of be interwoven, what you've been doing in the past, and you interweave AI, or do you recommend sort of parallel pathing your roadmaps? Maybe start with the agency representative. The outcome, yes. The outcome, like I said before, speed is absolutely critical here, but I think getting there, that education hump, and not only education, us explaining how this works, hiring the right people, actually somewhat of a turnover of a skill sets that are required to be a modern agency moving forward. Uh, that's exactly what we're going through right now. Yeah, I think from our standpoint, we have a saying progress over perfection. So it needs to be integrated, but also holding hands with our clients and really building that relationship and know that we're testing at the same time because we're all in it together. It's changing. I make the joke that you could be wrong today and it doesn't matter for tomorrow uh, because it's just it's changing rapidly. But if you're not interweaving it, I feel like you might be missing out because then it's the upper hand. So the differentiator is just testing it, making sure it's integrated, and then hopefully it, it pans out well on the other side for the industry in itself. I don't think AI is going to change the fundamentals of, of 
advertising to consumers, right? That, that notion that you need to reach the right audience, that the audience that engages with your offering, that you need to reach them the right amount of time so that you don't piss them off, but you make an impression, and then you need to understand what the outcome of that impact has been, right? That's what we call targeting, frequency capping, and measurement. That'll still be through still be true in 5, 10, 20, 30 years, right? Brands will still want to engage with consumers. Maybe brand AIs will want to engage with consumer AIs, right? And that, that will be like a, a, a... How do you build trust like between two butts? <laughs> I don't know, take, the, take them out, have a drink, right? The usual way, right? And then one, one of them asks, asks the other one for an I.O. <laughs> yeah. I think... I, oh, I was going to... Go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say that I feel like AI is just another platform and other medium. So like, I mean, back in the day, like 10, 10 years ago, you're like, oh, digital is like the new AI. And now all of a sudden, like retail media is the new AI or, AI or whatever. So now it's going to be one of those pieces where you have to dabble in it, you have to understand it, make it work for your business. But ultimately, it's that other medium that you're going to have to learn it as, as it grows. All right. So we've, we've covered, well, really, we fused addressability with AI. So I think we did the AI ability uh, <laughs> module here. Uh, but I want to get to the, the third uh, of our three A's today. But I want to start actually um, asking the audience, by a show of hands, who would say that you're really familiar with what attention metrics are? All right, we got a few. We got a few. But it's still a relatively new concept, I think, for a lot of folks. We know what it is conceptually. But I want to throw it out there. For the uninitiated, maybe the panel can help us. Um, can you describe what they are and how they are measured? Anybody want to jump no, in? No, actually, no. <laughs> Next I, question. So you, you didn't raise your hands, I, so then maybe that's... I, I, exactly. I, I, and I think that's part of the issue is that there isn't a uniformity. There's not, there, exactly. there, there's not a uniform standard across the industry, and it desperately needs one. So it's not CTR. <laughs> no, it's not CTR. <laughs> You're good with that. If it's not CTR, it's, sure. it's better. <laughs> To me, like, is it basically a lean in versus lean back experience of, of a message, right? So the, the attention of it like, and, and, and measuring it again, you're right, that there's no standard to, for everybody to just agree this is the way we're measuring the lean in experience. Mm -hmm. Is it how much time was consumed? Is the engagement uh, with, with the message? This is why uh, DCO I think is so critical because that it adds additional points of information to see whether it was a lean in or lean back experience with the message. Yeah, for I mean, for lack of a better term, it's one of those things where it's, are they in that mindset when you're advertising with that given consumer? So, I mean, my whole world is retail media. So if someone is on like, you know, like target.com or walmart.com or something along those lines, you could advertise to them knowing that they're thinking about it. So I think that's really important. And I feel like we're trying to be as efficient as possible. So to drive a sale. Um, so it, it comes down to that, but yes, to your point, there's no taxonomy, there's no nothing, so that's only my focus group of one response right there, but yep. that's my perspective from my background. And that is one of the challenges to adoption, right, is the lack of standardization. But we do know there are ingredients um, in how uh, attention metrics are constructed between eye tracking, empirical measurement. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how the different platforms out there, whether it's Adelaide, Loom, and others out there, how they operate, um, and which paradigm or a combination of paradigms you think will prevail in the end? I don't know yet. I don't think it's possible to have one because it depends on the message and depends what what are you trying. Well, how are you trying to get engage the consumer? Is it right. the retail? You're trying to actually complete a sale, or you're trying to inform, or you, like what exactly are you trying to do? Yeah, and yeah. it's it's almost like. And how are they receiving that message? So are they watching it on, you know, like their TV, CTV? Are they on their phone? And so if you're on your phone, is it motion? You know, so it, it just really depends on how it's being delivered, I think. So you have to have relationships with all of the above yeah. to figure that out. And I think it's pertinent to understand who your audience is. And then that's how it, it could potentially work now. So do you think the medium of consumption, by the way, is what the standardization will then sort of... Um, coalesce around? I believe so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, but it, it takes you down to the, you know, the, the, the same dynamic that we've had in the past, which mm -hmm. is that the, 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 you know, in performance media, for example, mm -hmm. that you're, you're, you're more highly tuned to the, um, uh, to the tactics and the signals that are closer to the sale. Mm -hmm. And we, 
we discount and, de and incorrectly mm -hmm. devalue the, the signals that are further up the chain. Mm -hmm. I want to say the funnel, but I don't even know if the funnel even exists anymore, right? It doesn't. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, exactly. So, and, and there, there's it, still it, it, a, there's a, a funnel from brand love to, to complete sale, right? So if yeah. you think about it, like at, the, at, at those. Yeah. Right. It's, it's a journey. Sure. Journey. It's a journey. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the subjectivity of, of attention metrics, I think, is the, is the issue mm -hmm. here. I, I think one thing we have yet to see is the impact of the privacy, uphill privacy battle in this area and how that will play here. And you know, what does that mean for consent frameworks? Does a website have to say, do you consent to tra tra eye tracking? Or what does it mean when you're not on a website and you're in the open world? Can you actually do that? Um, that's going to be a really interesting set of questions for this whole privacy revolution that's happened in, in regulation. So I'll ask a somewhat provocative question around attention metrics. And you sort of hinted at this when you said, is it CTR, as long as it's not CTR. <laughs> so that raises the question, are attention metrics just simply having a moment because we have this you know, deprecation of IDs and standard traditional ways of measuring ROAS of campaigns? So in the absence of that, attention metrics have come to the fore. Or is there something real and sustainable and preferable about attention metrics? I think there's this desire because, especially digital advertising, it's so much more measurable. So constantly looking for ways to better validate the spend and then the overall investment. Right? That's what I mean by spend. So I think it's that kind of, I have all this data in front of me. How do I use it to, to understand my investment a little better than I did yesterday? I wouldn't oppose the two. You still need to understand the attention of a person or of a, of a consumer, right? So it's not like, oh, we can't, we can't recognize consumers anymore, so let's measure their attention. That doesn't work, right? You still need that. I think it's, it, it hopefully, right, it's, it's our chance to kind of get away from CTR and kind of improve the level of measurement that actually, you know, means something for brands. That, I think that's a great, that's a great uh, innovation, but I wouldn't link it too much to what we're going through from an identity standpoint. The two have to work together, because if you can't measure, if you can't identify the person you're measuring the attention for, like, it, you're back to square one, so. Mm -hmm. I think it makes my world more complex, <laughs> because right now, retail media, everyone is measuring differently and calling everything the same, and it's not. So now you're throwing attention media in there, and it's the same thing. I think, if anything, it creates more of a 3D yeah. result versus how, just how do you understand weight the different criteria. Right, right. So I think it, you have to be really crystal clear on the audience and then how you're actually, tr whatever your you know KPI is or objective is, that you're delivering upon that. And then these metrics can help. But I don't think it's like the end all be all. That's important. The KPI does, right. did that move the needle? Yeah. The additional investment yes. clearly that went in mm -hmm. uh, to now try to measure differently, mm -hmm. did that move the needle? Do you go back to AI to figure out what the weighting should be for each of the different criteria? I don't know. <laughs> machine, 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 machine learning. Who, who trained we it? Should, we should, we should ask at AI. We should actually yeah. ask and it? see what the answer is. It, it's biased. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that. It, it has what? biased KPIs, though. Yeah, what's the AI attention on this? Uh. All right, well, that is my set of questions. So let me uh, open it up to the audience. Right there, I would love to hear some questions. So. Hi there. Uh, I'm Tamika Key sorry do we want to give you a mic so we can all hear you okay. thanks i'm tamika key with the coalition for innovative media measurement that's why i know what attention metrics are but i had um probably the only one but i had two questions one was it it goes back to the ai you all kind of alluded to ai as a tool for feedback right and and helping sort of the models not be so terrible but it doesn't work right now, right? Like, I don't know if you, if you use Spotify. I tell Spotify all the time, I don't like this song. I don't like this song. <laughs> and it still sort of puts songs like that in, in, my, in my feed. And that's a, a simple version of AI, right? So I guess one question is, you know, do we expect it to work better than the basic AI that, that doesn't follow our instructions and recommendations now? You just have very eclectic music, musical taste. <laughs> you're, you're a complicated person. No, um, uh, there is a fundamental difference between traditional machine learning and the modern AI. People have been using the term AI for years. It's mostly been marketing smoke. Uh, supervised learning is the traditional method. You train on a data set, it predicts what it's trained on. 
artificial intelligence is beyond that neural networks. They are generative. They will create something new. So most of what you've experienced is the traditional not AI-based machine learning. And the real question is, when you do have a generative AI, um, can it do what it does when you ask it a question in ChatGPT and actually create an intelligent generated response? I, I think we will see, I think we're just scratching the surface on how effective it can be. I think it's a toy compared to what it will be in a few years and all of those problems will be much, much better. And even maybe you'll have a conversation with the AI and, and it will apologize and like fix itself. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Um, so you guys, sorry, I'll go. Hi, Grant Ogburn from UM. Um, so you talk about the, the, the next iteration of the internet. You talk about kind of the future of AI. As you guys see AI continuing to learn um, and being able to adapt and to, to create its own processes or modular components or, or to mimic other pieces and then it continuously learns and optimizes and it's looking for single source of truth. Are you starting, would, would you predict that we would start to see kind of a sea of sameness or a race to one iteration of something? So I, and the, the example I'll use is like diagnostics. Every time I sneeze, WebMD says I have cancer. So <laughs> if, AI is calling the internet for, f for fake information. Is the new version of the internet a single source of truth? Yeah, when everybody's, when everybody's using the same model that's trained on the same data, then your outputs are gonna look similar, which is, uh, again, you know, I go back to one of the earlier statements where it's, it's about stacking and building on top of that to, so you can get to the execution that Maybe is uh, you know in, in 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 an ideal is differentiated from others, but is at least unique to you, you know, or unique to the brand that you're working on, or unique to the audiences that you're that you're targeting. And so, I, I think it's a multi-layered approach to get to the point where you, you, you know you're not in this sea of of AI solution sameness. Yeah, I think one of the fundamentals of AI is change. It can evolve and it will evolve on itself. So every interaction will change it. And it's the architecture is very similar to a human brain. And so an AI exposed to some things will evolve differently than an AI exposed to other others. I think in the end, probably one of the driving rules will be that it will be closer and closer to precision and accuracy of an answer. But um, I think there's, it's completely feasible to have a world where there is a multitude of different you know, AIs that are personality based and that have just a different ex experience from everything that it was exposed to. And if you really want to bend your mind, there's this classic sci-fi series called The Culture Novels, um, one of the best sci-fi authors in history. And there's just, there, there's a whole, uh, theme of AI eventually, you know, eventually getting uh, the rights of humans and just evolving in its own ways that are based on some of these same principles. It's interesting. But I love this point of the internet being a single source of truth because ultimately isn't truth going to be subjective to the individual? And that perfect example of the healthcare uh, scenario, you know, somebody who has a cough based on their circumstances and who they are, that could be lung cancer and somebody else it's more clearly pneumonia or a common cult. So truth is going to be subjective ultimately, or what we call truth in the, in, in the context of any individual, yeah? I think that's low resolution data that, that can, it could, it's more like, it could be these 17 things, but the AI will also say, but the cough was this long and you did it right. this period and it was after you did this and, you know, and a million other micro things and it will say, it's actually this form of cancer. I think it's a more of an accuracy thing. I think there's a cautionary tale in this, you know, um, in the in the sense that the the truth has become somewhat subjective, and uh, you know what's true to one audience may not be true to another audience. So to kind of think of this as a single source of truth it may not be the best frame of reference, and it's really incumbent upon the entire marketing industry to have a very high standard of ethics because. A lot of this started with advertising tools, and uh, and and we should be cognizant of what you know commercial greatness we can attain and what implications might have further down the line.
But what's really interesting from that perspective is that machine learning, data science, AI, like fundamentally are, are statistical based. So what it's doing on the inside is saying, this is a 79% likelihood, or, or this is a 99% likelihood, and it could probably actually expose that much more than um, our simple ways of approaching. This is true and this is untrue. It's probably more of a statistical model. It goes back to, I think, human emotion and trust, though. Without it, it won't work. Like we have, you know, multiple news channels say, t taking the same story and turning a completely different right. angle. Like, how is that any different? It's the same fact technically, but it ends up being completely different fact by the time they're done with it. And it depends on your behaviors. So, I mean, I know people that will Google something and ride on that train until <laughs> until the end. <laughs> so you could be that way, or you could be. So interpretation still remains with the humans. It has to be. Always. Yep. H-I. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. The answer to AI is H-I. Um, I want to thank uh, all of our panelists, Matthew, Jay, Amy, Tamar, Oleg. Uh, fascinating conversation. Probably, probably raise more questions than we answered, but that's probably the good thing at this point in time. That's the, that's the market that's good the, panel. That's the right answer. So thank you again. Uh, really appreciate your time. And everyone enjoy the rest of your CAN experience. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Quick question. Hey guys, also, you know, lunch comes with the panel. Um, and I think Abe wanted to come up and say a couple of words just to thank you guys for coming. And uh, please stay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's this, there's this human intelligence at play here. But thank you very much, guys. Thank you for coming in. Thank you, everyone. For me personally, I think the most transformative moment of uh, AI was when I heard Sal Khan talk about how the future of education is going to be on that TEDx talk. I think that was probably the most transformative. How many of us have seen that video of uh, Khan Academy guy? Uh, this was very interesting. He said that the that the potential of AI is not to be able to do things better than what we can. It's to transform the way we can. He actually presented a model that where AI can actually solve the two sigma problem, where the entire human intelligence can shift by two sigma to the right when we can give a intelligent teacher to every student, which can actually teach uh, things differently. So I think fundamentally, uh, just like with all of you guys here, uh, you know, I'm an optimist and I'm literally thinking not how to do things better, but how to do things that we literally could not do before. And that, that wakes me up every single day to figure out. So problems of fraud, problems of uh, creative optimization, problems of uh, privacy, problem of things being done on the device when you know, we'll not be allowed to take things back to the server uh, the, as freely as we have done in the last 20 years. So I think, thank you very much, guys. Thank you for all your time. And uh, lunch comes with the panel at Kistasas. Cue the music. Thank you.